Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been asked to do this in French, so I'm going to switch to French um, so that you know. Um, but obviously, we have a Q&A period after the first hour, and then you're welcome to ask your questions in English, and I'll probably answer them in that language. This is arranged with the translators. So I'm switching to, to French. Donc c'est un, un plaisir d'être ici avec vous. D'abord, je tiens à remercier euh, mon bon ami Pascal, euh, l'organisation euh, et la mobilité de m'inviter, les partenaires ici à Co. Euh, et vous souhaitez tous un, un très bon séjour dans l'esprit euh, très intéressant qui vient d'être expliqué. Je pense que d'ailleurs que les, les valeurs qui ont été un petit peu mises en avant sont également celles dont on va parler. Un, un nouveau départ pour une région. Euh, une facilitation de l'échange. Je crois qu'on ne pouvait pas imaginer un meilleur endroit littéralement pour avoir cette discussion. Donc ce que je, je me propose de faire dans euh, environ l'heure qui va Alors, suivre... Je ne suis pas sûr que ça marche juste. Ah. Il est là, je le vois parler, mais je ne suis pas sûr que... You're not hearing me? Yeah. Are you hearing me now? Should I just go... Uh, oh, go on in English. It's fine with me, it's whatever, whatever you guys prefer. Go on in English, it's alright? Oscar? Is it okay if you go on in English? For me, uh, for me that's fine. That's not yeah, well, that's okay. Okay. No, no, I expect you to go on in English because I think the great majority is If the majority is in English, then it's better. Yeah. Okay. Just stick to English. That's easy for me, the PowerPoint is in English, so. <laughs> They should just know that. All right. Okay. So um, what we'd like to do with you, um, in light of the program that you have, is to actually go over um, a series of events, essentially taking a step back, looking at what has happened in the region, this general region of the Middle East and North Africa, uh, the Arab world. I'll come back a little bit to those terms in a minute. Um, and as I said, take a step back and. First of all, have a snapshot of what has been taking place over roughly, as has been mentioned, about 20 months or so since this began, uh, a good year and a half, uh, drawing lessons of what we have in front of us. Then I will highlight a few elements which I think are key, fundamentally the notion of switch from revolution to transition, and I think this is one key idea that I would like to develop with you, um, and then taking that into an engagement. I look very much at a, an exchange with you, an exchange of ideas, of opinions. What I propose to do in the first hour is to give you the presentation itself, to share with you the insights, the analysis. Then, um, as arranged with the colleagues, maybe take a break, and then coming back for the discussion, your questions, your comments, agreements, disagreements, everything is welcome, of course. Um, so what I suggest is that in the first presentation, you can certainly interject, but I would suggest if you have uh, clarifications, questions, maybe more than long extended commentary, which is more welcome in the second part, simply for the management of time and as arranged with the translators. So this is essentially what I would like to do. Um, my, literally my starting point is seven key ideas that I'd like to share with you in relation to what we have with this. The first one, is that I think we have had an extraordinary year and a half. I think there's been a lot of discussion about the spring, but not the spring. I share some of the limitations of the concept itself. There's the media discussion, but we have to realize that there has been an earth-shaking series of events, and as a whole, a fundamental moment of rupture, as it is. Therefore, what we can conceive of as this moment, this historical phase in the period of this region, is forever changed. Secondly, the jury's still out on what ultimately will pass in history as this Arab Spring, this period of uprisings, revolutions, revolts, whatever you want to call them. What literally transpired between December 17, 2010, when Muhammad Bouazizi set himself on fire in Tunisia, and essentially the spring of 2011, let's say when you had a succession of key transformations, this four months period in this overall year and a half is fundamentally a moment where, as I said, the jury is still out. How it will be assessed over time in history, we still have to keep our options open in relation to this. 
third key idea is that the transformations are uniform. We can speak in the singular of an arrow frame series of transitions, but they are fundamentally increasingly different. And I think that over time we will have to speak more of an arrow frame in the plural, unpacking it as we go in the specific histories of Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Bahrain, Iraq, if something happens there, certainly Syria, on and on and on. The unpacking of it goes out from this moment that, as we will explain, has some connections. Fourthly, probably for the first time in history, the Arab citizen is at the center of his or her own story. We have had episodes of attempts at that in the past. And let's not think that everything has changed overnight in 10 and 11. But for the first time, we have visibly a moment of recapturing of that story. And I'll go a little bit more in depth in relation to what that means. Fifthly, the harvest that we have in front of us is complex and pulling in many ambiguous and different directions. We have more democracy, for sure, that is undeniable. We have more religion, visibly. We have more conservatism, that is a little bit unexpected, but it's also a reality, and I'll explain that. And we have more globalization. These revolutions, in many ways, these transitions are far more connected to the global environment than previous revolutions and transitions. And this has implications that we will need to understand. Sixthly, there will not be a new stability in the region without the new legitimacy. And that equation is at the heart of this. Stability, which is fundamental to the transitions, will have to go through a new type of legitimacy. And when you think about what's happening in places like Libya, for instance, that has already begun its process, then we have to see how, what does that mean in terms of a new type of legitimacy let alone Syria, which is not even there, Egypt certainly on its way, to Tunisia, which I would represent to you as possibly a success story so far, relatively. Finally, an Arab world that would have found for once, historically, its dignity, will be a more reliable partner, certainly. But it will also be a more demanding partner for the world. And I think this is a welcome development, because it moves away from the paternalistic relationship that the West had had for a long time with the region. And so for once, I think we would have to ask in relation to this, not what to do about the Arab world or to it, but rather with it. And it's this translation of a partnership that I think is at the heart of what we have to think of in terms of some of the ideas that I propose to explain to you and discuss with you. So my starting point, if, yes, if I can move forward a little bit, is essentially built around these three key ideas. First of all, historically, taking a step back to try to understand what are the factors that led us to where we are in the contemporary history of the region. Secondly, looking at the political dynamics during the revolutions, literally what played out. I think we found ourselves, even in social science where we work, or in think tanks, or in organizations, NGOs, or policy offices, depending on, or even in the private corporate world, depending on whatever background you're bringing to this discussion, we have found ourselves too often too close to the issues. And I think what's needed now is to take a step back, see a little bit what his, history has to say about this, what the dynamics, and then finally, I will offer some projections to try to give us a mapping of where we're heading and what we might see as some uh, elements that can help us decipher a little bit. My starting point is therefore this. This transforming, highlight the I and G at the end of transforming, this process. Where we literally have, and you know, they say a picture speaks a thousand words, a series of staccato transformations between, as I said, the, the spring of last year, where literally from one month to the other, and remember how we lived through this drama, this exciting and hopeful drama, we saw these images, which are real. There were these scenes of fraternizing between soldiers and little girls in Tunisia, uprisings in Egypt, Yemen, I don't even have Bahrain here, Libya, Syria, many other places uh, that have not even begun or made their own transitions. And so this reality is the question that I put to you, is there a new paradigm shift that we've experienced? I think it's important to process that because we have left this, if you recall, 
10 years of post 9 11, where we have internalized another paradigm, this uber terror paradigm. Now, of course, the terrorism concern is important and we have to work with it. But if you recall, after 9 11, we went through 10 years of this. And this, incidentally, is something that struck me. You know, I picked up this in Boston last summer, two summers ago. You know, the subway magazine they give you where you pick up and you read? And I was going through it. And I stopped at this page and I saw This Week in Global Terror. And the wording of it struck me. The normality. This week in global terror. This week in sports. This week in financial news. There's a certain presence that we have come to expect where terror literally is presented as developments around the world. And I can't blame the paper. Indeed, there's a development in England, one in Uganda, one in Norway. It's factual. But it's the perception, the packaging of it, of where we're heading, that struck me as something that has left some of us that can remember the 90s and kind of the nonchalance of the pre-9-11 world. I think this is important to see that this is a paradigm, which I will not discuss here, but simply to indicate that we might be, and to ask you your own views about that, shifting from one particular paradigm to another one. And therefore, what I'd like us to have at the back of our mind is the transforming nature of international relations. It's very important that we have a historicized, shall we say, perception of this. I said that we're too close to the events, but I also think that we have been going through a number of paradigm shifts over the past couple of decades which are important. And they have to do with these five key aspects. The first one is the place of the state in all of this. The state has been on the retreat, to use Susan Strange's excellent book of 1995, The Retreat of the State, which I highly recommend to you. She's discussing the retreat of the state in the context of the financial world. But it's really a place where we see the state becoming, taking a step back. It's the advance of globalization. Secondly, this is also another post, post Cold War, post-1989, you see individuals increasingly shifting their alliances and allegiances from big concerns about the state to rather causes, ideological ones, and increasingly also, we must admit it, cultural ones, religious ones. And we have to take this uh, at heart and discuss it. Thirdly, the more conflict we have seen around the world in recent years, the more fragmentation they have ended into. This is something to keep in mind as we see Syria today, literally disintegrating life before us. It may or may not happen, we'll discuss it, but it's certainly one of the paradigms that we're seeing. Mali is already de facto two states, I'll come back to that. Privatization of warfare, that is also an important element. The actual wrestling of the monopoly of force by actors that are non-state actors is also a new feature, it has implications. Al-Qaeda is a word that comes to mind. But think about many other actors, PMCs, private military contractors that act on behalf of the state, and so on and so forth. The privatization is also a new component of globalization. And we have to understand that. Finally, globalization. We take it for granted. The iPhones, the internet, the email, everything that we have come to process in our daily lives. But 20 years ago, and I'm not that old, it wasn't there. The world was different. None of us. So it has changed fundamentally the grammar of our lives and therefore the grammar of international relations and my point, therefore the grammar of the tra transitions that we have before us. These e-revolutions are the first such e-revolutions in history. 